Well, welcome everyone. Thanks for being here today. I'm Diane Bloodworth, the CEO and founder of Scout Smart, and we provide predictive analytics for sports. We predict the fit of a recruit for a college football team. And I, how many of you all have some knowledge of NIL? Yeah, you know what it's about. And it's really changing how programs recruit. So we have done a series of webinars and now this live event to really dig in and talk about what's happening in NIL. And guess what? It's changing every day. It's very much an evolving area. Uh, today, we're going to talk about some NIL perspectives, both from a company that participates in a collective and from the student athlete's perspective. So I'm gonna introduce our panelists and then warm them up with a few questions and then I hope we'll have some audience questions as well. All right, so first let me introduce uh, Luke Hughes. Luke is the Chief Growth and Marketing Officer at Everyday People Group. He's a graduate of the University of Georgia. Go dogs, yeah, go dogs. And he's worked for the EDPG family of companies since 2018, and he's built their NIL program to provide sustainable solutions. EDPG operates brands in Atlanta, such as Apotheos Roastery, Gabriel's Bakery, and The Nest Kennesaw. So welcome, Luke. Yeah. Awesome. And we also have with us Tice Farrell. Tice is a tight end for Indiana State University. Uh, in addition to being a student athlete, he's done some NIL deals. And I think he runs a Twitter feed for his fellow tight ends, which he calls the mules. Is that right? That's right. Yeah. So we'll be hearing more about the mules today as well. All right, let's start, uh, Luke, with you. Tell us a little bit more about what the Everyday People Group is doing. And I noticed in your bio you talk about sustainable NIL work with the collective. Tell us how you've been able to make that happen. Yeah, so um, it was actually about this time last year we got approached by the Classic City Collective, which is UGA's primary NIL facilitation group. And they were looking for partners who could provide the sustainable business models that would allow them to not only provide NIL deals for the famous players, the football players, the basketball, so on, but also across all 21 sports on campus. And so our work with the collective is predicated upon co-branding deals where we package, you know, roasted coffee, K-cup coffee. We sell office coffee accounts to Georgia business owners who were alumni. And in return, select percentages of those sales get donated directly back to the collective. We do not um, tell them what to do with the money. It is totally up to them. So it ensures a fairness where Stetson Bennett isn't taking all the money. We're making sure the gymnast will get the money. The women's tennis player will get the money and it's it's been a good endeavor so far. Yeah, that's great. I love the sustainable aspect of that. So talk to us a little bit more about how these collectives work and the benefits to both the athletic program and the student athlete. Yeah, so the collectives work in a very good way, which is they are trying to look out for, I don't want to call them the little guys, but the people who don't have the you know household names because Brock Bowers, Stetson Bennett, they're gonna get theirs. The NIL deals are gonna come their ways and their agents, whether that's their parent or an actual NIL agent, they'll handle that for them because there's enough money there. The collective is there to look out for the other 20 sports, the athletes who might have trouble getting their name out there, but they still deserve the right to economically benefit from their name, image, and likeness. And so the collective just does a very good job of spreading the wealth and allowing everyone to kind of eat from the table. So if I am a, a huge UGA fan, I can donate or make a contribution to the Classic City Collective? Is that accurate? 
Yeah, so actually the Classic City Collective's direct donation program is called the 21 Club. We got very fortunate winning a national title in 2021, so the marketing could work for that. But there's 21 uh, varsity level sports on campus. We won a championship in 21, and everyone who joins the club pays $21 a month, and it goes directly to funding the collective. But then, aside from just pure donations, you can purchase our coffee, which is part of that sustainable thing of not only are you making sure your money gets to the collective, but you're getting something in return other than just the pat on the back and the, hey, thanks for your money. Yeah, and that's great. And I know recently the IRS has ruled that those contributions to these NIL, these collectives are not tax deductible. So kind of interesting to get something for your money too. All right, Tice, tell us a little bit more about what you're doing at Indiana State on the field and a little bit about how you're uh, approaching NIL. Okay, so I'm a tight end here at Indiana State University and I'm a senior and my tight ends are... Uh, and on the NIL, they're trying to get their make their name. So I personally thought to help them out, I could make myself a Twitter account, and we call ourselves the Mules. And the reason we call ourselves the Mules is because for tight ends, you can't only be fast, but you also need to be strong. And so like a horse is fast, and then a donkey is strong, and the combination of those is a mule. So. <laughs> We decided to call ourselves the Mules. Our tight end coach made that, and then so we've just been running with it. Uh, I, I just post daily content, like what we do, like workouts, or like right now we're super into golf. So like I'll video us us golfing versus the other position groups. Like we're right now in the battle of uh, linebackers, and so we're down 1-0. But yeah, so basically I'm doing that. I'm just trying to get, just like he said, he said the people with not the biggest names are not going, they're not going to get benefited from it. So I'm kind of trying to pull all the tight ends together to, you know, help us all out. Yeah, no, that's great. So tell us a little bit about how you, I mean, being a student and an athlete, it's a full-time job. Uh, and I really appreciate Ty's finding the time to come to Atlanta. Um, and by the way, I'm just a little bit of story of how Tice ended up here today. He actually is under an NIL deal with Scout Smart to be at this event today. And I posted it on Open Doors and I got close to 500 people who applied to be here today for this panel. And Tice stood out to me because he had um, when he just, he reached out, he went above and beyond. He found out my email, he found out our Twitter, he DM'd me, he said, I'm your guy. Um, you know, the kinds of things you look for. But tell us how you bounced that being a student, being an athlete, and trying to drive eight hours and be on a panel in Atlanta. Yeah, it's, I mean, it's definitely difficult. Um, I think when it comes to NIL, I try to do it more in the summer because we don't have school, obviously, then. Once once I'm in school, it's kind of hard for me to worry about my academics, I mean, my practice, make sure I get my film down, scouting the next team we're about to play. I'm not really too worried about the NIL. But in the summer, I try to get them all lined up for basically the, for the full season. So that's what I usually do. Yeah, awesome. All right, Luke, we're going to go back to you. Talk to us a little bit more about collectives. You know, I mentioned the IRS is not allowing those to be tax deductible. I think we're going to see a whole set of evolving uh, rules and legislation around NIL and collectives. So how do you see that evolving over time? Yeah, so I obviously am not a part of those high-level conversations, even though I want to be. But the Classic City Collective actually recently sent their CEO, Matt Hibbs, to Washington, D.C. to uh, sit in front of Congress, kind of explain the collectives and talk through it. So obviously, there are some regulatory things coming down. We kind of haven't described it as the Wild West just because it's a new thing. People need to learn the pros and cons before you can obviously set up the rules that the system will then operate under. And so really, I'm not sure where it's going to end up. All I hope is that the economic opportunities are still there for the student athletes because that's really what NIL is about is making sure that the student athlete who's committing 40 hour work weeks to that team plus the academic slate is getting fairly compensated and justly rewarded for their name image and likeness. Yep, that's great and you're right that's what it's all about. I joke that 
since we do predictive analytics, we should predict which of these federal legislative bills is actually going to get enacted for NIL. So, uh, Tice, talk to us a little bit, kind of playing on that. What does Indiana State, what do education do they provide you guys? And from a student athlete perspective, would you like to see a standardized way of NIL, a standard agreement, uh, you know, have things be very open and above board? What, what from the student athlete perspective is important? Yeah, so Indiana State actually has their own collective. It's called the Crossroads of Champions, which is it's the same thing as Georgia, but they come in in the summer again, and they, they have their CEO comes and talks to us about what you can do, what you can't do, who you have to get it approved to buy. And basically, once they put you on their website, they'll pay you, and then after that, people can pay you for as little as like sending a video saying hi or happy birthday or any of that type of stuff. Um, I personally know someone who had to go to a birthday party and just hang out with, <laughs> hang out at a birthday party, which I think is pretty Aren't you cool. glad you got the panel? Yeah, yeah I'm glad I got the panel. Well, that's great. Um, so how do you pursue NIL deals then? Is, is there any uh, art or science to actually, uh, I mean, do you go on open doors, for example, how did you know that I was looking for someone to speak? Yeah, usually for my level, like FCS, I'm FCS Missouri Valley Football. Um, it's not going to be like exactly like Georgia because Georgia guys are probably going to get more of the business approaching them. And for my level, it's more us approaching them about seeing ways that we could help their business out. Um, the open doors, I just I like down I downloaded it and I was just looking through it. And I made a profile and I saw that and I was reading through it and I thought it was super cool and I thought I should apply for it and you know. Once I saw that, I figured, I figured a bunch of people applied for it. So I was like, yeah, I probably should go step above that and find out your email and email you. Yeah. Is it good? Obviously. All right. I'm going to open it up for any questions from the audience. I have a few more questions for these guys, but just based on some of the things you're hearing, um, and I don't know, Lillian, do we need a mic to make sure everything's recorded? Okay. All right. But any questions from the audience, just kind of what you heard? I know this collectives is new. Yeah. Yeah, we're, we're informal here. Luke was worried this was going to be like an <laughs> Apple product launch. I was like, don't worry. We're good. Um, thanks so much for being here, guys. So I, um, being a parent of some high school athletes, I'm curious what the, um, what's in, a financial, you kind of started going down this route, but like what would be a financial compensation or even like how much could they earn in NIL? Say they're not a big name, say they're kind of more of the FCS type type athlete. What might they be able to earn in a year to contribute to their college tuition? <laughs> on, oh, there you go. Honestly, um, I think it honestly depends on how hard the student athlete works for the NILs. Like if if you're if you're not gonna put any effort into it and you're gonna be a lower name anyways, you're not gonna get anything. Like if I didn't put in the effort to contact her, I, there's no right way that out of the 500 people she'd just randomly pick me. I'd have to luck, wish on luck on that. But yeah, so I I would say probably around two thousand dollars maybe. If if you if you work towards it, I mean I'm sure Georgia or all those other schools could get paid a lot more than that. But for my level, that's why I think about the at average for someone who works hard at it. And thank you so much. And one more thing on that. Do you find, because I know you're talking about Twitter and your Twitter account, do you find like social media is a is a valuable, like a social media profile is a, is a big part of being able to recruit um, good opportunities for you? Or is it alternatives like open door and relationships? Or what, what do you think is great? Yeah, well, I mean... Our Twitter group has gotten a lot of like notice because we're just we're just goofy on it all the time and we just look at businesses and you know, they they follow us obviously on Twitter and they see us and they think it's funny and they want to help someone out who they thinks funny so I mean yeah it stood out to me and we are working on a score for an NIL predictor score and 
we look at one, what position, what level of play. So if I am a power five quarterback, you know, I'm have a, a likelihood of having a higher NIL score. But the next thing is the social media presence. You know, how many followers do I have on TikTok, Instagram, Twitter, and how engaged is that following? Um, and I know some of the folks we've interviewed in our webinars have said some of the D2 and D3 players are making a little bit of money just because they have such a social media following. And I think we see some of the female athletes being really successful at that. Other questions? Yeah. Um, you said there are a lot of pros and cons, and I was wondering what some of like the cons are to NIO. I mean, obviously, I would say one of the cons is just uh, monitoring the return on investment. A lot of people just want to give a lot of money away to these athletes, uh, not accusing anyone of anything, but you know they want the best athletes for their school. So is their business cutting the check because they think they're going to get a marketing return or because the owner of the business is just trying to guarantee a certain result on the field? I don't know, but when we're setting up our deals with our athletes, we donate to the collective purely, but we also kind of curate our own athlete deals on the side. Yeah, so one of the ones that we're mainly working with right now is the starting uh, offensive guard, Tate Ratledge. He is a fiend for our coffee. That man cannot get enough of the coffee. We actually ended up installing a cold brew coffee kegerator in his house. And so the man loves it, and we're really trying to track the return on investment for it. And we know it's there just because Tate has a very good social media following. He has a podcast he does pretty much weekly with his teammates. And so it's just being thoughtful about the activation of the NIL deals as opposed to just throwing money trying to get athletic success. Yeah, and there's not a whole lot of historical data right now because NIL is so new. Um, I know we hired a, a student athlete a year ago. He had gotten more than 50 offers on the Scout Smart platform. He's at UCLA. and um, But I could, never could quite measure, how do I measure, you know, the return on investment from some of his social media posts. So I did it for one season, but it didn't make sense to continue it. So I think that's... That's the challenge, and I think that's where the sustainable portion of it comes in, too. Hey, Mark, uh, best, best kicking coach in the country is with us today, Mark Nolan. Oh, this is on. Is on? Yeah. Um, gentlemen, thank you very much. Welcome to Atlanta. Hope you have a great time down here. I'm a Notre Dame graduate. I played football for a guy named Ara Parsegian 100 years ago. Um, so I have a different perspective on NIL. Diane and I have had some great conversations. She was a guest on my podcast. Um, so I wrote a book called uh, College Athletic Scholarships, and I've been speaking at high schools throughout the United States. Uh, to me, I coined the phrase NIL meant now it's legal. And recently, I also said now in litigation, because as you know, there's probably over 100 lawsuits right now that's going on. Um, to me, uh, honestly, as, a, as an athlete myself, my son's a former athlete, an All-American, uh, to me, it's the valuation that we put on these people, like Raycon Smith is a great example. D2 kid, right, out of Norfolk State, making millions of dollars, okay? He's got a great social gathering, goes to social media. But I think it comes down to when you ask a question about, you know, is it in the best athlete's interest? Uh, I, I can remember I had a paper out at, at South Bend. I delivered paper at 2 o'clock in the morning. Okay, I was on scholarship. I went to RTC, right? Um, What's funny about that is that the National Collective Association, I, unfortunately, I call them, I'm a little, I have a little different opinion of the collectives. I, I think they're more of the mafia, but that's okay. It's my opinion. Uh, hey, it's, it's America. We all get yes. to have our own opinions. So. Yes. And, 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 I, and I will and say this, like it or don't like it, I think it's here to say, right, Mark? Uh, yeah. Absolutely. And there's, this is, there's great things for NIL, you know, that, that's done. But I, I believe that in the long term, there's going to be so much litigation that's coming out. I mean, I know Ty Fricks very well. Ty Fricks and I go back. I used to train him when he was a long snapper at Georgia. Uh, and I trained all the Georgia kickers and punters since 1992. So Rodrigo, for instance, would have been a great NIL example, you know, just on his stuff. But I, I, hope, I, I hope and pray that when you ask about NIL deals and things like that, the average NIL deal, just take a guess. Anybody have an idea how much the average NIL deal across the United States is? 
It's $3,711. That's not what your kid gets. So when we're screaming for $15 an hour working at McDonald's, you know, you can actually make more money working at McDonald's than you can on, a, on, a, on an NIL deal. That, that's just my point. And, and I think that's why everybody has to have some research when you go after these NIL deals. They're very, very tricky and state-wise. Yeah. yeah. Thank and, you. And we believe, yeah, no, thank you, Mark. And, and absolutely, I think that education is important, and we are partnered uh, with a group called Ecker Sports that does education for the players, for the co high school coaches, for the college coaches, for the parents, because you're you're right, and it, and it is going to change. So, yeah. Hey, my name is Sarah. I am also a former college athlete and a former college coach. Um, at the Division II level, I got out of coaching around the time NIL officially passed and uh, athletes were starting to have these opportunities. And so I um, actually have two questions. And the first is, how has NIL changed recruiting, the recruiting process? Do you know? On, I mean, on well, and your... I can talk a, a, a little bit about that. I think that especially for some of these Power Five players, they're going to look and see what kind of deals uh, the other athletes in their program have gotten, right? Or they should. They should be asking. Um, so it definitely has changed it. It can't be used as an inducement, but I think... And to Mark's point, I think a lot of these kids think, hey, I'm going to make a lot of money, whereas just a handful are going to make a lot of money. But the coaches have to talk about it. They have to talk about the kind of education that they have. Do you remember, was there anything during your recruiting, Tice, was there any mention of NIL? Yeah. No. That's probably the right answer, too. Yeah. That's the truth. <laughs> <laughs> your 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 program will thank you for that, but it but it is changing uh, recruiting. Thank you. Um, my second question is for Tice, and um, it's we've kind of talked about it a little bit. And being a student athlete is a full time job between classes and all of your obligations as an athlete. Um, and you mentioned kind of your tactic is like try to get things lined up in the summer so that once football season comes around that like you can focus on that. And so I'm curious, um, two things is, it is how, like how has NIL added to your workload if you will, even if you line stuff up in the summer, like what does that look like added hours per week or per month? And then um, my second question is, Shoot, I lost it. That's the gist of it, though. <laughs> yeah, um, I'm out of added hours. I don't know how if I have an exact amount of added hours. I just do it when I'm like, instead of like playing video games for me, I like, you know, might as well look at what nil deals I can try to get up. You know, I, that's what I personally do. I I know I'm sure people spend a lot more time and like really scripted out and all that. I like to do that, but not the, during the school year. I just usually just do it when I'm bored or not bored, but you know, I'm not doing anything after practice or, yeah. That's, good. That's a good skill to learn, uh, getting ready for the business world. Uh, it, hello. Uh, I am Tommy Jackson. I am a professor at the University of West Georgia, uh, Freeman Matthews and Gary uh, Fellow. Um, Maybe played a little football in the day? I may have. Uh, no, so I uh, played at Auburn University from 2002 to 2005, two-time All-Conference, freshman All-American, played three years professionally. Now I'm a university professor. Um, and one of the things I've done is I've drafted legislation here in the state of Georgia. Currently it's House Bill 838. We are working to create some legislation around uh, name, image, and likeness. You brought up some very, I've heard many things right now. I've heard some great questions, some great comments. I just kind of wanted to make sure that people understood with some of the research that we're getting right now. One, it's very new. A lot of people give a lot of the numbers what they, you know, what they believe NIL is doing. However, um, it's not done in the same way that we do research at the university. Also, being somebody who's actually played the game of football on every level, I understand why NIL is happening the way that it is now. It's just like anything else. Whenever you build a new business or have a new business model, there's not enough legislation yet to, to make sure that there are guardrails. It's kind of the conversation we were having before. So sure, we could worry about what could happen, but consider this. 
um, the billions of dollars in revenue that the athletes have produced. They've never been able to share in that revenue. So now you have collectives who do a, a good job of making sure that at least students have an opportunity to have, you know, to make the money that they're creating from their, their physical work, their names, their images, and their likeness. So because of this, I think it's important that we understand that it's going to take some time. It, 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 this is not an overnight process. But if you look at kind of what we're doing, um, our state will be probably one of the first states to have some legislation that goes along with name, image, and likeness. And it will deal with some of the questions that minors have. Um, when you think about some of the things that are happening, happening at the university level, um, it's pretty unique, especially with looking at collectives and having businesses work directly with student athletes. Absolutely is gonna change the model. Absolutely is gonna change recruiting. But this is why legislation is so important. Um, I think when this comes up, I think this is something me explaining to those individuals that live in Georgia. Please make sure that you're speaking with uh, your representatives and explaining them why this sort of thing is important because we'll have guardrails. We're able to kind of build from there if we have something as a, as a basis because right now, what do we have? It's a lot of guessing, uh, a lot of assertions, a lot of speculation and not research. In my field, as a researcher, um, it's important to have verifiable data we want our data, we want what we're doing to be valid. You know, we, we want valid information. So um, I, I think it's easy to kind of create a fear mindset when we think about what could be with college athletics. But uh, as you stated before, um, this isn't new. Like the NIL has been going on for a while, but now it's actually done in a context that I think that people can actually benefit. And so I, I, I personally am happy to see companies come out and working with the collectives and working with students because prior, we didn't get a thing. <laughs> and so um, I'm just, I'm more so excited to see students being able to jump in and make money for doing things that they're really good at. It takes a lot of talent to go out there and create a, you know, a page for yourself and get guys engaged. I think you got a real career in this, I gotta be honest. And obviously, Luke, you know the work you guys do with the collective, it's amazing. And you got guys making you know, money from the things they do. I just wanna make sure we don't do the fear mongering because it happens a lot. Um, people often say, oh, this is terrible. This will be the worst thing ever. Why don't we see? We'll see, we'll see. We'll use the legislation to guide us and I think we'll continue to work together on forums like this, but we'll see. So you. are you making any predictions on the federal legislation? <laughs> <laughs> I will say this. You know, typically you allow federal legislation to guide state legislation. I think we can be in reverse in this case. If we do this right, uh, I think it will be done right. Um, we'll get something in place to where I think others can look from. And I'm all for sharing our work here because the idea here is to protect the students. That's the goal. We want to see these students able to build for themselves a life that they want. And we want to be able to have that done in a way that fairness is still key for the, stu for the schools that they're competing against, right? So I, th I think at some point we're going to have to start talking about salary caps. At some point we're going to have to talk about a formalized system. It's a lot like the good thing about being in the National Football League. I remember being a part of that whole collective bargaining thing. Again, this is something that's very important. I think we can't forget about what the sports industry is. It's an industry, so we have to treat it as such. Um, just because these students have the label student athlete, it doesn't mean that this isn't a business, so we have to treat it as such. That means we have to educate our students on what they're able to do, and I think even when it comes to federal legislation, that comes from the people. The people must put a fire, if you will, under those representatives that are in Washington. If we want legislation, we have to do the work. That's kind of where this whole project came from with me being a fellow. I know there was work that needed to be done, so I wrote a law, and it just so happened to work out. So uh, the way I see it is if we work together and we kind of stay away from the speculation and fear mongering, I think we'll be fine. But again, I think that's going to take a concerted effort, people truly trying to make sure students are protected and they can monetize their ability. So. Yeah, awesome. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, got another question here. Yeah, I wanted to ask, Ty, this is kind of piggybacking a little bit on what Tyson, uh, what um, Tommy was saying. Um, I was getting Tyson, Tommy tongue tied. Um, <laughs> so, uh, Tyson, I wanted to find out where did you get your education around NIL and, you know, how do I do it? Who's keeping you kind of focused on the right way to go and how to do it so that you don't get yourself in trouble? I don't know if you can get in trouble or not. But where does that education come from? 
So yeah, um, mostly it comes from our coach. Basically, once once NIL was like introduced, our coach made us have like a mandatory like Zoom call, and we all talked about it for. And then they brought in the Crossroads of Champions, which is the the collective. They brought the CEO in, and they basically just talked to us about for like probably a, almost two hours because a lot of guys had a lot of questions because I mean. It's brand new. They had no idea what they what could do with it, and then everyone got super happy right after that. But uh, yeah, basically that was it. That was the one. It was like a one-time thing. But then, I mean, you can obviously reach out. They gave us their phone numbers and emails, and um, people reach out to them all the time. So. And when I did the deal with Tice, then we have to get approval. Uh, from his program, it does go for approval as well as the previous NIL deal did. I always make sure I have a contract, that there's a clear understanding of the expectations of what the student athlete's going to do. And I want them to learn a little bit about being in business for themselves, being an entrepreneur. I want them to understand they're, this is really an entrepreneurial venture for them. So I have a question about how long it lasts. Um, I'm going to bring in the transfer portal. I mean, if I'm a, an athlete at Georgia and I'm benefiting from the collective and then I decide I'm going to go into the portal and I'm going to go to Oregon. Or USC. Or USC. Or wherever. Or Ohio State. Or, Ohio, or Indiana <laughs> University. Um, how, do, do you get like kicked out? Do you lose your NIL deal? Can you pull it back? How is all of that done? And how, I mean, who follows the dots? Uh, well, I mean, I think that just comes down to the contract and the uh, proposal that both sides agreed to. I mean, if God forbid Tate Ratledge transferred during the next open it portal so. window, yeah, I would probably still want to follow him with our NIL deal just because the brand he's curated around himself with his love of our product just naturally being there. I view him as a brand ambassador where obviously my heart's with the dogs. I would hate if Tate left, but I still see the value in carrying an NIL deal with him even if he were to go to any other Power 5 university. So when he graduates or when he decides to leave college football and go to the NFL, does it end there? Uh, well, the relationship would still be there, but I think the negotiating leverage gets flipped on its head because <laughs> as of right now, Tate's still mostly in control, but then all of a sudden you're at the National Football League, you all of a sudden have a different level of power and leverage over us, so he could ask for more money, and if we want to meet him there, we'll meet him there, but I think it's just, it's just a matter of his position in life and what he can ask for for himself, and that's totally his economic right to do that. So it's all part of the contract is basically. And so you can draw it up and say, this contract lasts for one year or one month or like yours, you said one season. So, okay. Yeah, and, and it is great for student athletes to set some terms in there because in some cases you're, you're giving away your identity for a, into the future. So you really, and you're not thinking about that right now, right? You're thinking about, hey, can I get this deal? So there, those are great questions uh, and things that these student athletes need to think about. Yep, I think we got one more question here. This one's for Luke. Um, how does the collective, particularly speak to the Classic City Collective, how does it make supporting your favorite team more accessible to everyday fans? Because, you know, historically... You go to fancy galas, they say, hey, here's a painting for $20,000, Kirby Smart signed it, but you're about to have a generation of people who maybe can't cut such a big check to support their program. So what are things you're doing with the Classic City Collective that makes it accessible to fans? Because we talked about accessibility of bringing in athletes, regardless of its Stetson, Jalen Carter, any of those people. So how does it make it accessible to the fans to support them? I mean, yeah, as I mentioned with the 21 Club, with our coffee purchases, it allows, if all you have is $21 to support the program, it's there for you. And then the collective is trying to find good kind of marketing activation points where they understand that you're not the big baller donor, you're not joining Georgia's silver circle with over a million dollars donated. You are the actual, you know, backbone of the fan base. You're the fan showing up on the road at the Rose Bowl in L.A., everywhere the dogs are going. And so they're trying to find unique ways to connect the fans with their favorite athletes, whether that be football, basketball, baseball, name any other sport. 
And so, I mean, they host tailgates all throughout the fall. Obviously, I hope the football players are not showing up to that. But other CCC athletes will be there, and they're constantly updating their schedule and trying to find other activation points. I know that Tate and Ryland Goad recently had a uh, live podcast recording at a local hotel in Athens. I'm blanking on the name right now. And then they also hosted a summer concert series where they brought in some big name country music artists and it was an opportunity to enjoy a night of music and oh, it just so happens that a good chunk of the football team's in that room. So if you buy a ticket, you're gonna support the NIL, get some entertainment and meet your favorite players at the same time. Yeah, that's great, ties some ideas for you to take back to Indiana State too. All right, guys, uh, any final questions? I've got just a final question for the panelists. All right, so Tice, what's next for you? What, 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 are you, what are you predicting this season for your team? Uh, hopefully some wins. Um, <laughs> yeah, we got, we got a good schedule this year. Uh, a lot, Missouri Valley football is some serious football, like for the FCS, for the FCS football, it, I consider it the best. It's definitely the best, not if. It's definitely the best conference to be playing in. And uh, yeah, we have a good schedule this year. We, we should be good. We have a quarterback back. He uh, got won the freshman of the year for the Missouri Valley. So he's back. He got some years of experience under his belt. Um, we got most of our own line back. Um, we should be good. I mean, I'm hoping we're good. We play IU, and then we also play Ball State. And then the IU game's on Friday. It's a Friday. I don't know the exact date, but it's on a Friday night, which should be fun. So you got a new fan base here in Atlanta. Yeah, that's think, right. Uh, he was kind of surprised when he went to the mall and it's like everything has got bulldogs on it, right? <laughs> yeah. All good. And Luke, what's next for the Everyday People Group? Talk to us just a little bit about that. Uh, yeah, I mean, we're just going to keep searching for more NIL partnerships at the University of Georgia. You know, we signed a deal to be exclusive to the Classic City Collective. So, I mean, I was already going to stick with UGA anyways, but... We're sticking with UGA, and as our company grows, we're just gonna keep trying to grow our NIL division and just ensure that more players across more of the sports on campus are getting equal opportunities to benefit from our deals, as well as us benefiting from the brands and the audiences that they themselves are curating. Great, let's give them a round of applause for being here with us today. Thank you guys. Great job. Thank you all for being here. We appreciate you.